Our scripture this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4, that is in the New Testament, uh, verses 1 through 6 and 11 through 16. If you brought your Bibles, that again will be found in the New Testament. It's about halfway to the back. Uh, If you turn halfway in the middle and then halfway again, you'll get to Matthew, and then halfway one more time, you will find Ephesians in there. And Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 and 11 through 16, it'll be on the screen also. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Give us eyes to see the world the way that you see it. Give us ears to hear your voice and hearts to receive what you would give to us today. And make us bold. Make us bold as we leave this place and go out into our world to be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name, amen. So today is kind of our back-to-school Sunday, if you will. And if you have children or grandchildren, uh, this is definitely on your mind, right? You've been shopping and um, school supplies and new clothes and backpacks and all that sort of stuff that goes along with back-to-school time. I remember one of my favorite parts of back-to-school time was new shoes. Anybody like to get new shoes? Whenever I was a kid, could anybody else run faster and jump higher in a new pair of shoes than you could in your old ones? Yes, yes, they were magical shoes, weren't they? If you're an educator, I'm guessing that you are probably struggling to get your brain back into school mode, right? Back into school mode, and I see Steve and Sandy over here nodding their head because they're over here going, I remember that, and I'm thankful I don't do that anymore. Yes, bless you teachers. So last week, Susan wrapped up our summer sermon series, Words of Life. And hopefully the time you invested in learning about the Old Testament prophets and and their message to a specific people at a specific moment in time, hopefully you found that these words of life benefited you and that you were able to take away something and implement that into your daily living. Because after all, that's what our faith is intended to do, right? It is intended to influence our daily living. It's just not something that we come and do while we sit here and then when we leave, we leave it all behind. We're intended to take it with us. During the month of August, we don't have what is a a normal series, but as Susan and I talked about our sermons, we identified this common thread that was really weaved among all of the topics and the sermon titles and the scripture. And that topic was calling. Not like on the telephone, okay? Calling, God's calling. And it occurred to me as I I began to to process this, this thread, this topic of calling, that outside of our parents and our grandparents, teachers and coaches 
and, and leaders, they have the greatest possibility to breathe words of life into us. And they influence us and they can either speak words of life or they also have the ability by their very position and title to also speak words of doubt or we would call that words of death if we're talking life versus death. It's a powerful person. They have the ability to encourage or they have the ability to discourage. Think about that. The simplest definition of of encourage is Encourage means to infuse courage. Infuse courage. So if that's encourage, then the opposite of that, discourage, means that you are actually removing courage from an individual whenever you discourage them. Courage to do what? Courage to think, courage to grow, courage to try new things, courage to live, courage to do whatever it is that they are attempting to do. So you have the ability to build up, through encouragement, or tear down through discouragement. This past week I had the privilege, and I I do mean that. It was really, I'm not one for seminars. I don't like to sit all day long. But I went to a coaching seminar in Indianapolis, not like athletic coaching, okay? Uh, I don't get to do that anymore. My girls are, are beyond that early stage where I'm qualified to coach. But more of staff coaching and life coaching. So I attended this, this seminar, okay? And one of the questions we were asked to ponder was this. Think of an individual who communicated something to you very succinctly in 10 words or less, if you can, who communicated something in 10 words or less to you that was words of life, and those words stuck with you. So someone who communicated something to you, what did they say? Words of life, ten words or less. And then we were asked to talk about that in groups of two or three. And I was thinking about my job, and I was thinking about what I do and and what I value, and and I was thinking about my preaching at that specific moment. And what came out, uh, what came to memory was these words. And it's not quite ten words, but it was, tell us what you're going to tell us. Tell us, and then tell us what you told us. Speech teacher, 1990, Daytona Beach Community College. Don't remember his name, but I can still hear him saying that before every class I had with him in speech. Tell us what you're going to tell us. Tell us, and then tell us what you just told us. And I use that kind of as a loose framework for almost every sermon that I give. Somehow there is a setup of what I'm going to tell you. Then I tell you what the message is about, and then I try to recap at the end. It influences what I do weekly, if not prepare for daily. Another pastor's words of life were from an athletic coach. The words, and you can do it. And you can do it. So almost 40 years later for this individual, this coach, whenever he would teach them a skill or or tell them something that they were to do, as an individual player, this coach would say to them, And you can do it. Wow. And you can do it. And this pastor said that he uses that phrase whenever he's coaching a staff member or even when he's working with an individual church member in transitions of life. You know, the transitions of life like starting a new job, becoming a new parent, um, getting married, um, perhaps transitioning from your home into a senior living facility. He tells them, after he prays with them, he says, and you can do it. Wow, power. Another pastor shared this. It was a youth pastor that had shared these words. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. This youth pastor would say that every youth meeting. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. And then this youth pastor would invite those kids to bring their friends and show them. And what he was saying essentially was, be careful who you hang out with now. Be careful who you give your time to now. Because it will have a direct impact on who you become later. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. 
Now, I want you all to take about 30 seconds and go through the file cabinet of your brain and think about a teacher or a coach or a leader that said words of life to you that you still remember. And maybe you don't remember the exact words, but you remember what was communicated. Maybe it was elementary school or, or maybe it was high school. Maybe it was college. Maybe it was post-college. I don't know who that individual was. Can you think of it? Anyone come to mind? Some of you all have got a lot longer to remember than others. I'm just throwing that one out there. A lot more file cabinets to go through, right? Can you all remember? Does it stick with you? I'm getting a lot of blank stares. I need positive affirmation here. Some of you were slow learners. We'll just throw that out there. Anyway, so leadership is influence. Teachers and coaches are therefore leaders. And influence is power. And power can make a lasting impact on an individual's life. Now imagine if you thought of that teacher or coach or leader that made an impact on you. Imagine if they had said no to their calling. Teachers have the ability to influence hundreds if not thousands of individuals over their lifetime. And through you, their students, they then influence hundreds if not thousands of more people. Imagine if when they were called to be a teacher or a coach or a leader, and it is a calling. You can't spend a lot of time with preschoolers or kindergartens or, God forbid, middle schoolers and high schoolers without it being a calling. Imagine if they'd said no. What void might be in your life or what voids may be in the lives of others? So I want you to take away two things from, from this part of the sermon, Okay. I know some of y'all were saying, well, he's wrapping up. This is good. No, we're just getting started. So, two things I want you to take away from this part of the sermon. Teachers, you make a difference in the lives of those whom you teach. You make a difference in their present reality, and you make a difference in their future possibility. Present reality, future possibility. And the same is true for coaches and for, for leaders of all sorts. Remember that you matter. The second thing I want you to take away is that what you teach, what you coach, what you lead extends far beyond the subject matter or the sport or the context in which you teach, coach, or lead. Okay? Because wisdom shared and encouragement given are tremendous and irreplaceable gifts that will guide the children, the young adults, the youth throughout their lives. So remember, you make a difference. I know you don't always see it. Some days are hard, but you make a difference. Your preparation, your hard work, your late nights, they are not for nothing. You make a difference. Now, let's pivot to this question here. Who is called to teach? Before you go tuning me out saying, well, that's not me, okay, you're not a teacher by vocation. But let's expand this question a bit. Who's called to teach at school in their education system or at church or in the community or in your workplace? Who's called to teach? Who's called to coach? And again, if teachers and coaches have great influence and leadership is defined as influence then teachers and coaches are definitely leaders. So who is called to lead? The Apostle Paul. Okay? He was a traveling missionary, if you will, in the early first century. He traveled throughout the ancient world around the Mediterranean Sea, and he planted many churches. And, and he sent letters to these early churches and he named spiritual gifts and leadership roles and positions, okay? So think, if you will, Ephesians was a letter to the church at Ephesus that he had planted, okay? Romans was a letter not to the entire city of Rome, but to the church that Paul had planted in Rome. First and Second Corinthians, letters to the church at Corinth. Thessalonians, 
a letter to the church at Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, however you choose to pronounce it. So you get the picture here, okay? These, these were letters of correction, of explanation, of encouragement, of direction to those early churches. And they, they're included in our canon of Scripture, okay? It's our Bible. And they're included because they contain guidance, correction, explanation, encouragement, direction for us today. They're included because they contain that information for us as individual believers, for the church that we call Hillside, for the broader church, for Christians everywhere. Those letters are included because they influence the past, the present, and the future. So we believe that this guidance that Paul wrote to these churches is timeless. So even though it was sent to a specific people to address a specific issue or problem or circumstance we believe the guidance is timeless and transferable to our situation and our present environment does that make sense i need some positive affirmation here yes pastor chris that makes sense i'm not getting it yes thank you okay if it didn't tell me and we'll go over it again so so follow me here if if paul's letters are addressing specific issues and circumstances, then the natural conclusion would be at some point, Paul received communication from these churches in which he identified issues, problems, or circumstances that need to be addressed. Does that make sense? So his letters were a response to what was going on in that church at a specific time. So let's just imagine, if you will, okay, take a little bit of creative license. Imagine here, if you will, the church at Ephesus to whom this letter, Ephesians, is written. Let's, let's just imagine what could be going on that would elicit or solicit this response. If Paul's response is to encourage the people by writing that the church is intended to operate as a unified body, God has gifted the church with preachers and prophets and teachers and evangelists who are then in turn tasked with equipping the church for works as that it's intended to do. Then what conversations or communication would have taken place to lead Paul to respond with such things? What might those conversations look like? How about a letter that says, Paul, Will you please send us somebody who can join our group that's qualified to preach? Paul, Paul, we need you to send us one of your missionary assistant type people, okay? An evangelist to preach in a revival that will, that will spur emotion and enthusiasm among our people so that more people will come to our group. More people will hear about Jesus Christ. Send us an evangelist, Paul. Paul, Paul, we have a shortage of, of Sunday school teachers and small group leaders and, and Wednesday night workers, Paul. We don't know what to do about it. Paul, will you send us someone who can teach? Paul, we've got all of these, these widows and orphans and people in prison and and all these people that need love and care, they need someone to visit. And you put in place deacons, pastors, to visit and care for these people. But there's just too many of them, Paul. Will you send us more deacons or pastor or shepherd type people who can take care of our people that need visiting and loving and caring for? I imagine at this point Paul realized that it was time to kind of shift gears. Because it was this point that he realized the responsibility of a teacher, of a coach, of a leader, was not only to pour into other people, to pour into them, but it was also the responsibility of a teacher, a coach, or a leader to draw out of. To draw out of them. Did you catch that? Good teachers, they don't just pour into they also draw out of. So Paul's approach was to remind him of what he and other missionaries had tried to teach them, okay? Taught them about their faith. Sometimes he told them bluntly. Sometimes it was kind of gentle. 
everything that you're asking me to send you is right there among you. The teachers, the preachers, the evangelists, the prophets, the workers, the pastors, the servants, it's all you. It's you. You are all of those things. God has equipped the church, and since you view me as your leader, Paul, it's my job then to draw out of you what God has poured into you through me. It's my job to draw out of you what God has already poured into you. Paul said it's time for you all to self-identify leaders who can also teach, preach, evangelize, pastor, serve, work, love, lead. It's time for you, the church at Ephesus, to identify all these things. You're the leaders that you're asking me to give you. Who among you is going to answer this call? Who is willing to do the work of the church? That's what Paul was asking the church at Ephesus. So this comes to two things that I want you to grasp from this part of the sermon. Teachers. Number one, pour into those whom they teach, coach, or lead. They pour into them. So you give something. Okay? And number two, teachers, coaches, and leaders also draw out. They draw out of those whom they teach, coach, or lead. So you ask that something would be given. So the first one is you give something. The second one is you ask that something be given. Now, some people are really mental picture people. So think of this. If you're a teacher, okay, you teach your students something, right? Then what do you ask them to do? Demonstrate what was taught, either by a project, a test, or a paper, right? And good teachers do what? They give their students all of the questions, and then they do what? They teach them the answers, right? We're not hiding anything here, right? It's in like, like pop quiz every, every week. You, you, you tell them what you're going to teach them, and then you teach them, and then you ask them what you just taught them. So you demonstrate what they have learned. Coaches who coach athletes, players, or band members on certain skills, at some point you ask them to do what? Demonstrate those skills, right? So first you ask them to do it in practice, and then it's game time. Or performance time. The individuals that you lead at work in an organization or on some sort of committee or team. At some point, you have to get out of the way and let the participants lead. At some point, you have to allow them to demonstrate the skills that you have been teaching them. And as pastors, at some point, we have to get out of the way and encourage our people to live out the faith that we have been encouraging them to embrace. The majority of the time, when you're a teacher, there are additional life lessons or life skills that extend far beyond the classroom, right? extend far beyond the field or the court or the workplace. And they're only drawn out of individuals through real-life circumstances, right? Baptism by fire, you ever hear that? Baptism by fire. I wasn't going to share this, but I will. She's sitting there. I'll, I'll apologize later. So one of Susan's biggest concerns to me was, I've never prayed in public before. You never prayed in public. You'd never know it, would you? Then I got cancer, and she came on staff. And her response to me was, whatever you need me to do, I'll do. There were some Sundays she came in to work, and I was hanging over my trash can and saying, the only thing I can do today is preach. You're going to have to do everything else. Some Sundays I didn't even show up. I had scheduled pastors, and she had to do everything else. Very quickly, I had to get out of the way. I was forced to. And very quickly, she had to pick up that baton and run with it. Hope you don't mind me sharing that. I'll apologize later. So this pouring in and this drawing out, okay, 
it's also associated with a scientific principle. Any science teachers in here? The principle. Every action must have what? You all remembered the example. Yeah, every action must have an equal and opposite reaction. So my, my rough and much simpler definition or explanation or summation kind of comes this way. If it goes in, it must come out. If it goes in, it must come out. Don't believe me? Hold your breath. Go ahead. Do it. Draw in as much breath as you can and hold it. At some point, it's going to come out. You may turn blue and fall on the floor, but at some point, it will come out. Any of you drink a lot of coffee or water or soft drinks this morning? Just hold it. You don't, you don't believe that principle? Okay. See, our bodies, our bodies demonstrate that principle, right? Our, our liver and our kidneys and other organs that we won't talk about. When stuff goes in, it gets rid of it, right? We call it waste. What happens if those organs no longer get rid of that? What was good, water, coffee, debatable, what was good going into your body to nourish it? What happens if your body does not remove part of it? It becomes poison, doesn't it? So yes, too much of a good thing can definitely kill you. What comes in must go out. Biblical geographical description to help with your, your, your mental picture here, okay? In Israel, some of you all have been there, the Jordan River flows throughout the entire country of Israel. Starts up at Mount Hermon, fed by springs and snowfall melting. Flows down through the springs at... My Brian's gone blank, anyway. Flows down through the springs and into the Sea of Galilee. Around the Sea of Galilee, it provides life. Fish, very, very much a fish-eating culture. Water for drinking. And then it flows out of the Sea of Galilee and it flows down through the rest of the, the, the country. And that country is known as what? The land of milk and honey for a reason, right? It produces huge crops of produce and vegetables and, and fruits on trees and all that. And it's all fed by the Jordan River. But at the end of the Jordan River, it gets to the Dead Sea. And it's called dead for a reason. Nothing lives there. Why? Life flows into it. Water that feeds the rest of the region flows into it. Why is it known as dead? Because it has no outlet. They can't find an outlet. There's no water flowing out of it. So minerals and salt build up in this dead sea and nothing lives there we didn't get a chance to go into the dead sea this last time but when you get in the water you will float from all of the minerals but fish don't live there they don't fish in the dead sea because they can't live there because all of those things that provide life to the region above it all of a sudden when they don't flow out of the dead sea it's dead Susan said this best and I'll give her credit for this Stagnation stinks. Eloquent words, but I thought about that. I wrote that one down. Stagnation stinks. Anybody have a birdhouse at your house? A bird, I mean, a bird, bird bath? What happens when you don't clean out the bird bath? Bad. Bad. Anybody have a pool? Do you run a filter which puts chemical and oxygen? What happens if your filter breaks? and it no longer runs and the water just sits in your pool it stinks it stinks so let me wrap all this up for you and I'm going to try to be as simple and blunt as possible okay so I don't mix words here teaches and coaches and leaders and workers that we need in our church and in our community are already here they're already here and it's it's you it's you so are you called to the classroom and what is your classroom? What is your classroom? It's you. 
What are you called to do? And at some point, God is going to call you to demonstrate, to live out the faith which you claim to have. God will call you to share that faith with other individuals, either in a teaching setting, a small group setting, or a real life circumstance. So I really want you to wrestle with this question all month long. What is God calling you to do? And to answer that question may stretch you a little bit. It may make you a little bit uncomfortable. You may shift in your seats a little bit, and that's okay. Wrestle with that question. Because I believe that the Sunday school teachers that we need are already among us. They just may have never taught a lesson. The children's church leaders that we desperately need on Sunday mornings are here. They've just never stepped into that classroom to lead our children's church. Our adult small group leaders, which we need more of, have just yet to assemble a group. Our youth small group leaders, which we need more of, have just yet to interact with our teenagers. God bless you if you do that. Okay? Teenagers are good people. We love them. We all were one. We have compassionate caregivers among us who have just yet to make their first visit. And we have lay speakers and preachers among us who have yet to give their first sermon. It's partly my job to tell you that you can do it. You can do it. And hopefully this next year, we're going to give people opportunities to do those things. And me as your pastor, at some point after pouring in, you have to have a drawing out. And I have to get out of the way. And I have to say, let's do it. Let's teach. Let's preach, let's love, let's lead, let's serve. Let's do all of those things because you are the church and we will not live out this mission and vision which is printed on the front of your bulletins, by the way, if you need a refresher. We won't live this out if you are not given an opportunity to live out your faith. We won't live this out then if given the opportunity you don't step up and say yes. And try something. So what is God calling you to? Where or what is your classroom? Is it the church, the workplace, the community? And will you say yes? Because you can do it. Whether or not you think you can, with God's help, you can do it. Listen for God's voice in prayer, in Scripture, and through other individuals, listen. And then say yes. You can do it.